Uh, hello, um, and uh, thank you all for coming to tonight's communications forum. My name is Seth Manukin. Um, I'm the director of the forum and will be the moderator this evening. Uh, we have these talks roughly three times a semester. Um, we would love it if you all would uh, let us know how to reach you with that sign-up sheet so we can let you know about future talks. Um, we will not spam you. You will only get six emails a year or three a semester, so it's not very onerous. Um, our next forum is in two weeks from tonight. Is that right, Chris? I think two weeks from tonight. Uh, April 26th, um, when Kevin Young, uh, who is the New Yorker's poetry editor uh, and the director of a Center of African American History and Culture at the New York Public Library, um, will be here talking about his new book, Bunk, um, about the uh, rise of hoaxes and fake news. Uh, um, and uh, the way communications forums run is we will have a conversation for roughly an hour. Uh, at which point we'll open it up to all of you for roughly uh, another hour. Um, and that's pretty much it as far as ground rules go. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce our panel. Um, to my immediate left is Stuart Stevens, uh, a political consultant who's worked on presidential campaigns for Bob Dole and George W. Bush, served as the lead strategist for Mitt Romney's 2012 campaign, and helped elect more governors and US senators than any GOP consultant working today. Stevens is also an author and founding partner of the consultancy firm Strategic Partners in Media. He has served as a strategist and media consultant to Governor Tom Ridge, Senators Chuck Grassley, John McCain, Thad Cochran, Roger Wicker, Dick Luger, and many others. Um, he's also written scripts for Northern Exposure. Uh, um, and uh, is, uh, has written novels um, and also does some journalism, uh, including a very, very memorable piece for Outside um, like 15 years ago now, right? Probably. You mean about taking drugs? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, uh, I wish I still was. <laughs> uh, uh, we can arrange that. Um, uh, next, um, Jennifer Nasser is the founder of Conservative Women for a Better Future a nonprofit organization dedicated to electing more conservative women in the Northeast. She's also the former chairman of the Massachusetts Republican Party. Uh, and during her tenure, Republicans won the US Senate seat held by Scott Brown, uh, otherwise known as the Kennedy seat up until that point. The people um, seat. Right. And, uh, and doubled their ranks in the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Um, and then on the end, uh, Dr. Daniel Barkoff, did I get your last name right? Barkoff? Yep, okay. close enough. Uh, is president of Veterans for Responsible Leadership, a nonpartisan political action committee that supports veterans who have demonstrated integrity and rational thought as they run for positions in local, state, and federal elections. He served for seven years as a member of the Naval Special Warfare Unit, um, otherwise known as Navy SEALs and is currently a faculty member and an emergency medicine doctor at the University of Vermont. Uh, so I thought I'd start out just by asking all of you how you got into politics. What brought you into, uh, into politics? And Stuart, why don't we start with you? Oh, um, you know, I grew up in Mississippi. I'm okay. the seventh generation Mississippian. And when I grew up was sort of in the Mississippi burning days. Uh, so politics um, in all its forms was very much part of our lives. Uh, my family was close to a wonderful man named William Winter, who uh, I had the distinction of working in all his campaigns, losing campaigns for governor. He ran three times and lost. And then finally I quit working for him and he got elected. There you go. Um, but he was, he ran uh, against the last about segregationist uh, in Mississippi, um, lost. Uh, and I just found politics, uh, just absolutely, uh, it was just life. It was fascinating. Um, then in Mississippi, everyone was pretty much a Democrat. And the Democrats were Eastland, Stennis, um, and I gravitated toward working for Republicans. Dad Cochran was the first because they were sort of running against that machine. Um, and politics is one of those funny business. Once you sort of start working on one side, you end up staying on that side. Um, so that. That's how I get it. Okay. Jen? So um, I grew up in New York, and my dad died when I was 10 of a massive heart attack, and I wanted to 
go to school to be a doctor. So I wanted to be a cardiologist. And I decided it was a really good idea to go to Stony Brook University, which has a medical school, and got there and realized I probably wasn't as smart as I thought I was, <laughs> or that I was when I, if I was at a school that wasn't committed to sciences. And um, during the summer between my sophomore and junior year, I was working in my local village hall, and a man came in and he said that he was going to get signatures on petitions. And I said, for who? And he said, why, are you interested in politics? I said, yeah, I, I am. For who, why, do you want to know what you're signing why here? Do you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, he wasn't asking me. He was just saying that he was getting them. And he goes, oh, great, made a phone call. And then 30 seconds later, I'm on the phone with this woman who said, come to my house tonight and get um, the petition forms. And so in New York, I lived in Nassau County, which is still kind of the last bastion of GOP political machines. And I went to her house, and it was everyone from Al D'Amato and George Pataki. And I went out, and I grew up in this town, and I worked in our not only did I work in the Village Hall in the summer, but I worked in our local, one of the local restaurants throughout all of high school and college. And I went and I got maybe eight forms, 50 signatures, and I went back the next day and I hand them to the woman and she goes, wait, you got this all done? I'm like, yeah, I know everyone in town. So I got another 50 and I got those and I brought those in. So I collected the most signatures of anyone in my town. I was 19 years old. I, had, I was going to school to be a doctor. I went back to school, and I changed my major to be a poli-sci major. And then uh, I graduated from college, and my first job was with the state senator. And then that was kind of it. And then I moved here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have three daughters, and Donald Trump was elected president. That's it. Now, there you go. All right. <laughs> Succinct and to the point. OK. <laughs> Um, uh, so um, one thing I was interested in is um, what all of your perspectives were during the campaign. Stuart, I know um, you, like most of the world, uh, thought that Trump didn't have a chance in the primary and then probably didn't have a chance in the general election. Um, conventional wisdom certainly seemed to be wrong. Uh, but as this was unfolding, um, Dan, I don't know if you uh, um, identified as a Republican, but this was a party that both of you had been identified with for your adult lives. What was that experience like seeing uh, this figure sort of take over the party? <laughs> um. So out of the 16 candidates, I think I would have voted for like 13. And I knew, I knew it got bad when I was on a plane with someone that I knew from Massachusetts and going down to Florida. And I spent three hours telling her how Ted Cruz would be a better president than yeah. Donald Trump. <laughs> and like, my politics. Is, is he on your list of 13? No. Yeah, I, right. I mean, my politics are nowhere near Ted Cruz's. Right. So it's like, if I was saying that, then you know <laughs> things were getting bad. Um, and I also have three daughters. And um, I just couldn't believe, it, to me it was so much, right? I, I've been a Republican since I was able to vote. Um, and the man, number one, wasn't a real Republican. I mean, he, he was a registered Democrat. And then just became a Republican all of a sudden because he knew he couldn't win as a Democrat. And then his morals and values, oh wait, I'm sorry, there are no morals and values. <laughs> and so that was really concerning. Um, and I, he never seemed, I mean, growing up in New York and knowing people who knew him, he didn't pay his bills. He right. you know, consistently was borrowing. I mean, so like, if you look at what the Republican Party is, and it's the party of family that's not you know, what he was embodying. The party of fiscal responsibility, not, the par not what he was embodying. And so um, it was really upsetting to me. And, and it just continued to go. I mean, with the day of the Billy Bush um, right. expose, I was horrified. I just I said, that's it. I mean, it's one thing that he does what he does. But it's another thing that he's on a live mic and he gets caught saying it, and then it's just locker room talk. I don't know guys that do that. Right. Um, look, a lot of people were wrong about Donald Trump in 2016, but arguably I was the most wrong. Um, I uh, think that Donald Trump has always benefited. Uh, Dan and I were talking about this driving down from Vermont. 
uh, from the inability to imagine him winning. Um, and I think in the primary, uh, the consensus of these other candidates, and I have a lot of friends working in those, and I've done five of these presidential um, campaigns, and this nominating process is always fraught. Um, they had the not insane idea that uh, all you have to do is get along with Donald Trump, because obviously the Republican Party is not going to nominate Donald Trump. So you just want to be one on one, and you're not going to be Donald Trump, and you're going to win. So um, hence uh, all of this effort beating up on each other not to be Donald Trump, uh, which turned out to be a tragic flaw, and he benefited from it. I think in the general election, um, he uh, benefited from a lot of protest votes that didn't really imagine him being president. But I, I personally think um, when he came out with the Muslim ban that the party, Reince, um, should have uh, treated him the way that we treated Todd Aiken in Missouri, who was a Senate candidate um, uh, in 2012, who said these horrible things about women and rape. Uh, and the party just said, OK, this may cost us a Senate seat, but we can't stand behind this, and Aiken lost. Um, I think he should have done that. When he, a Muslim ban is nothing but a religious test. Um, and uh, he should have stepped forward and said, we're not going to do this. Uh, you can run. We can't stop you from running. But the Republican Party, as long as I'm leading it, is not going to stand behind you. Um, Governor Romney gave that tremendous speech that he gave on Trump. Um, once you don't do that, um, you just sort of get caught in these constant bargains with yourself. OK, um, he's not Hillary Clinton. OK, we'll get this judge, or we'll get that. Um, and it's just this, I think, really unfortunate uh, process. And what people forget about Faust is it's, it's not just the soul of your soul of the devil, but the devil didn't deliver. You didn't get what you wanted. Right. Um, and I think now, that's being uh, played out. And Dan, during the campaign, <clears throat> um, uh, if you had time to sort of think about politics with three incredibly young girls mm. at that point, uh, um, did you, could you see yourself sort of getting engaged in this way, or was this something that happened <coughs> as soon as, you know, the yeah. day after the election? No, it was uh, about a week after the election, really. Right. Um, but you know, the uh, uh, no, I, just like everyone else, I, you know, we didn't think he was going to win. Um, you know, I was not a huge Hillary Clinton supporter either, but leaps and bounds above you know that. I, I thought most people would see it in that way as right. well. Um, so no, this was never something I anticipated or planned on or anything like that. Right. Yeah. Right. But then, let me just jump so that. Your group, though, really grew out of a Facebook group. Mm -hmm. that, why don't you? Yeah, so I mean, we so you know, people complain on Facebook all the time. That's that's what happened. So um, you know, VFRL came about because my Naval Academy buddies and I were complaining about this on Facebook, and I and this was after the election. This was after the election. <laughs> you know, we kind of floated the idea of starting a Facebook group, which pretty quickly got a couple hundred members, and then. Um, you know, we decided to incorporate, and so we incorporated as a, um, you know, as a as a pack, and uh, you know, which took about four minutes of research, um, and probably twice that much time to actually do the paperwork, um, and you know, it's it's sort of started to resonate. The thing that surprised me about Trump, I mean, Trump, Trump voters are by and large, the parts of the country where he does well are areas that provide a lot of people to the military. And you know, so you have this selection bias where you know, people in the military are, are generally predisposed to like guys like Trump or, you know. Um, and guys like Trump meaning? Well, you know. Like the bluster, the machismo, or? Yeah, I think, I think there's, you know, Stuart and I were talking about this on the way down too. I think there's something to, um, you know, parts of red states in this country, part, you know, and, and it is the red states that contribute people to the military. You know, I'm, I'm from Massachusetts and we're pretty close to last in, you know, having people sign up. And, uh, you know, these parts of the country that contribute a lot of people to the military, you know, they really do 
um, you know, come from more of an, an honor culture. Um, you know, there's, there's much more comfort with, uh, with combat, with, um, you know, kind of these, these notions of, of masculinity that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, for better or for worse exist. And those people a lot of times are, um, you know, going to vote for someone with a, a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. And that's how, that's what I think happened in this election. I think that this election was one big F you to, um, you know, the establishment, so to speak. Um, but you, you talked, I mean, the other day when we were on the phone, you talked about how uh, um, in, during the Clinton presidency, mm -hmm. how there was this kind of revulsion at his, at Clinton's lies surrounding Monica Lewinsky. Um, I think you said something like, you know, Trump tops that every day before breakfast. Uh, um, so how does that sort of reconcile itself? Where does the revulsion against the, against dishonesty, um, how does, how is that so easily trumped uh, by the sort of machismo, the honor by, by, by that sentiment? So I think, I think there's two competing, and this is the entire idea of VFRL, you know, to, to back up in a second. What I'm, what I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do is um, convince veterans not to vote for Trump. And we're going to do it in states where uh, there are a lot of veterans and where the margins were pretty narrow. And specifically, that's Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and, and Michigan. And, you know, we're talking, and specifically, we're going to do it by You've taken public information from the VA about where people are using the GI Bill. And when you look at the numbers, there's enough veterans enrolled at colleges to swing two out of those three states right now using the GI Bill. So what I'm counting on, you know, back to your question, is that the way I view it is there's sort of two competing honor codes. And, you know, honor is, you know, I'm kind of a, I'm a cynical guy, I have a cynical sense of humor, but you know, mil the military culture of honor is, the, is why people or soldiers are able to go into combat and give their life for one another. That integrity, honesty, strength, courage, that's an honor code, all right? Um, it's competing, you know, for folks from, you know, red states, and in some ways it's competing against a somewhat overlapping honor code that they grew up with. Um, that is, you know, maybe not as prominent in, you know, a place like Massachusetts or Cambridge or something like that. But, um, you know, if you if you spend time around, uh, you know, kind of a working class environment, I think you'd, you'd be familiar with it. So, what has surprised me about the Trump voters is not how many Trump voters, you know, or sorry, rather, how many military folks voted for Trump. What's surprising to me is how many military folks don't like Trump, mm -hmm. which actually is a sign to me that that kind of second honor code that you know, people are inculcated when they go to boot camp, when they go to Iraq for a year and walk foot patrols in Fallujah, um, that that's more powerful, at least to some people. So that's the idea. Right. Jennifer, you said that um, uh, during the campaign, you, know, you thought, well, clearly, this, he's, he's, he's not going to succeed because he, he's not a Republican. He doesn't embody fiscal responsibility, um, uh, you know, family values, moral values, religious tolerance. Um, and when we were again talking to Stuart, I think you raised the point that uh, maybe that is what a, a Republican is now. I mean, if he's the head of the party, maybe we need to rethink what it means to be a Republican in 2018. What are your thoughts about that? No, nope, I'm holding firm in my convictions of my party. <laughs> no, I think it was, honestly, I think that the U.S. is still a very racist, sexist society. I mean, you know, I think it's, it's, it's not as intelligent mm. as everyone tries to make this out to be. It's very clear. This guy is a racist, sexist pig, right? And, <laughs> and, and, he was running against a woman, and there's a large portion of the country that's looking at it saying, I don't want a woman, one. Two, we just had eight years of a black man who is a Democrat, so we don't want another Democrat. We already had him. We went different. We're not doing different again. We're going 
back to the old white guy who has the same thoughts as we do everywhere else except for California and the Northeast. I mean, <laughs> basically that's what happened. And so, because it's amazing when you get out of the Northeast. It's even amazing in Boston. I tell friends all the time, if you sit at any restaurant in the city and sit near the bar area and sit near some millennial, like, not, not young millennials, like the 30-something-year-olds that are you know, nicely dressed, they love Trump. They're making money. They have good jobs. They live in Boston. They're super educated. There's nothing wrong that's going on there. I, you know, and then you've got the center of the country where these people you know, are, I think very differently. And so um, I think that, that it, it, it's, it's, it was so overthought as to why he wouldn't be elected, but it's so simplistic as to why he was elected. So I don't think that that's what the party is. I just think that. Unfortunately, the RNC, and I blamed Reince a lot, took their eye off the ball, let it happen. No one had any leadership there. No one was the parent, and no one, said, no one slapped him around a little bit. Everyone just let him go. But getting back to the notion of what the party is, I mean, Trump, outside of how people are voting, Trump has certainly, in his policies, also gotten huge swaths of the party leadership to go along with things that you know, three years ago would have been anathema to them. But I, I don't necessarily agree, because I think that there are different buckets. I think that there are people who really hate Trump in the, part, in the Republican Party. There are people who really hate Trump. There are people who really like Trump. And then there are people in the middle. And the people in the middle either don't approve of his, him as a person, but they like his policy, or they don't approve of him as a person, but they like that he's different. They like that he's edgy. They like that he's the guy that's on fire and, and really shaking things up. And so I, I don't think that the party changed. I think it was more of a, I think it was everyone's eye was off the ball. This guy came in, no one thought he was going to win, and then he got in there, and I mean, the people who, look, it, does anyone here think that we don't need term limits, that the people in Congress have any sort of, I was gonna say, listen, no one in Congress has a set of balls, right? That's why they're in Congress and they're not out working, because if they're there, they're safe and they're protected. If they actually have to get a real job, then they have a real boss who's going to hold them, their feet to the fire. And we as a society have let our elected officials think that they are celebrities. And because they think that they're celebrities, they're untouchable. So I mean, that's the mess that goes on, right? So we throw everyone out, and then 2020 comes. The thing is, there's no one to run against them on the Democratic side. So this just keeps on going. No, in 2020, you mean? In 2020. Right. Well. Yeah, although at this point in the cycle in two th for the 2008 election, I don't think anyone would have predicted that Barack Obama was going to get elected. So it's just, which is just to say it's hard to, hard to say. Stuart, what are your thoughts about, about how, um, what the, the, the identity of the Republican Party under Trump? Um, I'm in a pretty dark place about it. Um, I... Like I joined the party, or was drawn to the party, um, as a place that believes in the character counts, that uh, personal responsibility is important, strong on Russia, um, the debt matters. Um, and I look now, and it's, I don't know where all that went. It was as if those were just marketing slogans. And OK, so it didn't work. I mean, if you say, Chevrolet is a heartbeat of America. You're not really saying there's like a heart inside of Chevrolet. So, okay, we get, we'll just say something else. Um, to me, uh, I actually believe those things. And I worked for people um, that I thought shared those values. Um, and, and a lot of them did. Um, I mean, we were talking here, I, I first came to Massachusetts to work for Bill Weld when he ran in 1990, first Republican governor elected in 25 years. Um, and it, um, I, I don't know where that party has gone. Uh, and but more troubling, um, I don't know how you get it back. Um, I don't know how you unsay the things that Trump has said. 
Um, and I think the future, not the demographics or destiny, but Trump's base are uh, non-college educated white voters. Uh, and 20, wealthy white voters, right? I mean, it's, there's sort of a and, bar and, balance. And wealthy, um, though there's fewer wealthy people. Right. Um, but you know, 20 years ago, that was non-college educated white voters were 60% of the electorate. Uh, now it's 30% uh, and it's rapidly declining. Um, so uh, I really see Trump as a triumph of white grievance. Uh, not that everyone who voted for him was drawn by that. Um, but I, I think that the ability just numerically, having sat in these rooms, and bang my head against the wall um, so many times uh, to try to get to a presidential win. Um, I think the future of the Republican Party nationally uh, is very bleak. Um, if you can't appeal, everything we said after the 2012 election, if you can't appeal to more non-white voters. Um, I mean, I look at the Republican Party and I kind of think of Wang word processing in 1979. Things are great. So, um, I don't know. Like, what about computers? Don't worry. Um, so, I don't. I don't really know where the party goes. Do you still see yourself as being in the GOP? Uh, yes. I mean, I wouldn't let Donald Trump drive me out of a party. Um, and I work for people who I. I've never found a candidate that I agreed with anything, but one that's good. You don't agree with one spouse with everything. Right. Um, but I think that there are a lot of candidates out there that still have those values. Um, the, the question is sort of where is the center of gravity? I mean, when the RNC endorses Roy Moore, mm. where, where are we? Uh, Senatorial committee didn't, but the RNC right. did. Yeah. Um, and. It's depressing to look that 66% of white voters in Alabama voted for Roy Moore. I mean, we were saved by African Americans, not for the first time, and really African American women, to be truthful. Um, I find that just incredibly sobering. Um, and I don't know where you, once you've been for Roy Moore, I'm not sure how you get back any sense of um, of decency. But so if you have the National Committee supporting Roy Moore, you have... At the direction of the president. The only reason they did it is because of the Sure, president. right. But so you have the president, who's the titular head of the party. You have the RNC supporting Roy Moore. You have um, uh, what Trump says, not only about Muslims, but about any number of groups, about any number of things. Um, what would it take for you to feel like this was no longer your party? I mean, it seems like you've just listed a number of things that are beyond the pale. Boy, that's a bad question. Um, <laughs> I, um, you know, I, I spent uh, a lot of years actually fighting for these things. Um, and look, I, I'm not trying to pretend uh, I'm, that we were perfect. I mean, I worked for George Bush. I went down in 99. I wrote a book about the campaign. Uh, we had bad days. And we probably played on the dark side sometimes more than we should have. Uh, but we at least aspired to something you could be proud of. And on our best days, I think we came closer to that. Um, I think that we're a very personality-driven country. And absent <coughs> an alternative uh, person emerging, it's difficult to imagine how you get out of it. But I think... How you get out of... Where we are now. Right. For the party, you mean. Yeah. But I think it will happen. I think it will take someone who we can't name now running and winning. Um, and uh, then I think there really needs to be sort of a truth and reconciliation moment um, where we come to grips with what has been said and a sort of... Um, um, ugliness uh, that has been uh, made legitimate uh, in the current moment. Um, Dan, I, I know you're obviously not in an active military now, 
Um, I know uh, I found it hard sometimes to just pick up the paper, but certainly hard to pick up Twitter because I'm worried every day that there's going to be a new conflict in some part of the world because Trump was constipated that morning or whatever the case is and so fired off some incendiary tweet. Um, do, you, do you have any sense of what the effect of his, when, when he uh, threatens North Korea, when he says that we're going we're gonna to bomb, when he telegraphs his um, intentions about Syria, whether or not he then follows through on that, do you have any sense of what effect that is having on people serving today? The thing that I think, you know, maybe many people don't understand is everyone in the military nowadays is a volunteer and everyone in the military nowadays wants wants to work. You know, so when you have when you get rid of the draft in nineteen seventy three, you're stuck with the fact that your military wants to go to war all the time. And there are pluses and minuses to that. But that's, you know, uh, so does it have, you know, I think your, your question is, does it have a, an impact on, you know, what we call morale of the troops kind of thing? It, not really. I don't, I, I, I don't think we can hang that on, on Trump particularly. Right. I mean, I think there's, Lord knows there's enough to talk about with Donald Trump, but I don't think um, necessarily that's one of the issues. And so when you were serving, you mm. would have preferred to be in combat than not? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I was, I was a Navy SEAL. Like, Navy SEALs want to go right. to war. That's, right. that's just the truth. Right, right. I, I just, as I got to know Dan and his group, one of the things I, I was struck by listening to him speak with some of his other naval uh, grads is how you were saying that when you were at the academy, it's not that you were taught to be apolitical, but to be uh, a part, nonpartisan, but to be a partisan, not to be at all involved. Can you just speak to that? I think that's a fascinating concept. Well, I think you know, if you have a professional, a professional military, um, you know, the the you were you're you know you're there's a whole UCMJ, there's a whole you know uniform code of military justice that you know one is not allowed to you know exercise one's First Amendment you know wearing a uniform. Um, you know, you, you, uh, the expectation is that you'll at least not publicly, you know, go about and kind of espouse political views or support for political candidates and, um, you know, sort of as it should be. And I think, I think the best, you know, officers in our military, um, you know, really try to, um, you know, try to live that. You know, there's a reason you don't hear the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you know, weighing in on, uh, on Donald Trump. Um, So looking ahead then to, to 2020, um, what do you see as happening both in terms of uh, um, on, in federal elections and also in a presidential election? Stuart, I know you've made the case before that uh, um, for if a president does not accept federal spending limits, mm -hmm. as I assume that Trump will not, um, uh, I think the last president who was defeated who did not accept them was Hoover. Is that correct? And he had a bad year. He had a bad year, yes. Uh, um, so Which is something to, most people don't, can we just talk about that for a second? Sure, because, yeah. Um, you know, post Watergate, we passed federal funding for presidential elections. We had sort of a cockamamie system for the primaries that sort of died out. No one literally ever understood it. Um, but for the general election, we had a system. And when you accepted the nomination, literally when you walked off the stage after giving your speech to accepting nomination at the convention, you got a check. And in exchange for that check, you agreed not to raise or spend beyond that amount of money. It was around $82 million. Um, that started in 76, and it went through um, 2008. Um, everybody did it. It was actually literally a check. I remember it saying, like, can't we wire this? And they go, no, no, we do checks. Um, was it like a, a big, like, <laughs> it's like, know, a, it's like, like publisher's really, clearing house check? <laughs> so that's why um, in Bush World, we moved the convention up. Uh, I mean, we moved the conventions back because uh, we realized you're going to get the same amount of money. For W. For, yeah. Right. So, uh, 
in 2000, we had the convention in July, and then you know, in 2004, we had it as late as possible. You have to do it 60 days before the election. Because you're going to get the same amount of money, you want to condense the amount of time you have to spend that money. Um, now the conventions are late for no reason. It's sort of a legacy, it should change. But so in 2012, in uh, 2008, Barack Obama, and I think it's one of his most unfortunate legacies, um, decided that he would not accept federal funding after saying he would. Everybody said they'd accept federal funding. It was sort of a given. Um, now, if you read, uh, Dan, uh, uh, what's his campaign manager's, uh, Dan? Uh, uh, now I'm blanking. Uh, yeah. No, uh, no, 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 not. Um, he wrote the audacity to win. Um, Dan Plot. Yeah. David Plot, yeah. He's pretty honest about it. If you're, it's a good book. It's not a long book. He basically says, we did it because we knew we could get away with it. And we could raise ungodly amounts of money. So John McCain stayed in the federal funding system. So that meant he had 83 million. Barack Obama spent 750 million. On the day of election, Barack Obama had 33 million dollars cash on hand, which was like, at that point, you know, you spend like stupid money. It's like the question becomes not like if I spend this, will I get votes? It becomes like, well, I spend this, will I lose votes? So they still had $33 million they couldn't get rid of on election day. And McCain only had 83 to run his whole campaign. So um, the history of, of federal of finance reform in general is once something sort of the genie's out of the bottle, it's hard to get it back. So I don't think anyone is going to accept federal funding again. I'm a great advocate having done elections under both systems. One of the things federal funding did was level the playing field. It was intended to do that, and it actually worked. So Reagan wins, beats an incumbent president under the, the level playing field of federal funding. Uh, you have um, uh, uh, Clinton beats Bush, Bush under federal funding, under level playing field. Um, so if you just go to the next election, uh, whoever emerges from the Democratic primary is probably going to be broke. You're always broke when you come out of the primary. It would be true if Hillary Clinton was president. Incumbent president, Barack Obama raised about 1.2 billion. If you really kind of get out of bed and get working on it, you ought to be able to raise close to $2 billion. So you're going to have two uh, incumbent president with, I mean, who knows with Trump, but could, could with the potential to raise close to $2 billion, put it that way. No one says no if you're calling for the incumbent president to raise money. It's the easiest job in the world. Um, versus someone who's broke. So. That's tough. Now, maybe money doesn't mean as much as we thought it did. But still, um, it's, it's a very, very difficult situation. Um, and I thought, after going through this, that we really, in a way, had the law of unintended consequences, which always happens with, with campaign finance, that in many ways we probably abolished the four-year term when we let federal funding go away. We'll it see. It becomes an eight-year term basically becomes an eight-year term because it's going to be so difficult to beat. Now, well, that's a cheery thought. Um, I mean, one other thing that you had both in 1980 and 1988 was primary challengers for yeah, a sitting yeah, for an incumbent That's the president. other, I mean, just in a poli size sense, um, one of the indicators that an incumbent president will lose is being primaried. So even Buchanan primarying Bush in two, uh, 92, um, Hurt Bush. Um, certainly, Kennedy primary and Carter, you would have to say, hurt. Had uh, Bernie Sanders run against Barack Obama in 2012, uh, it would have hurt. If nothing else, you're going to spend a lot of money. And it would have hurt. Um, I think it's very important for lots of reasons that Donald Trump be primaried. Uh, it'll be very, 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 very difficult to beat him. But I think there's always races worth winning, worth running, even if you go into it not winning. And as would happen with Scott Brown, sometimes you enter those races and you end up winning. Who, who do you see as, as potentially challenging? I mean, g given how many national figures have uh, sort of gone along with him, who do you see challenging him? Well, Senator Flake is out there. Right. Um, my old pal and client, John Kasich. Mm -hmm. Um, those would be the two most obvious, I'd say. Right. Anyone, anyone else? Those are the two I always talk about. Right. And same exact thing. I mean, I think no one's going to 
No one will beat Donald Trump. My, my view right now is no one beats Donald Trump at all. Donald Trump is the president for the next six years. Uh, just because... Cyanide tablets are right outside the door. <laughs> I know. <laughs> My daughter came to me the morning after the election in 2016, walked into my room at 5.30 in the morning. I was on TV all night. I was like a zombie. I had to get ready to get back on. And she goes, are we moving to Australia? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Republican. <laughs> That's what my kid says to me. I think that was pretty impactful. Um, I, I think he needs to be primaried because I think that people like us need some hope and for him to get battered a little bit. but. You know, I, I, from the Democratic side, all I keep hearing from my insider Democratic friends is that they want Joe Biden. So it's like, that's great. Put up Joe Biden and Trump wins again. You know, so it's not, it, it, it's going to be very tough for him to lose. Um, but, but I think that there are Republicans that are really frustrated. I mean, and you see what happened, like, you know, Chuck Grassley, Marco Rubio were on TV talking about, you know, if Trump goes and, and tries to fire Mueller, you know, what, what, their, what their position is and that they don't think that that should happen and that there's a joint agreement to make sure that he's protected. I think that you're, you start seeing when some more monkey business is played, like tax reform, everyone wanted that, you know, and immigration reform, whether they wanted it out loud or not, they, they do want it, right? So I mean, there are certain things that they have to play in their districts and, and say things for their constituencies, but maybe innately they want. So they'll let that go. But I think once he starts monkeying around with the judicial system, then he's going to find himself in hot water. Okay. That's the only way you get rid of him, by the way, is right. if he's impeached, he he resigns, or you know, the the you know worst case scenario happens. And and so pushing that pushing back against that a little bit, I mean, certainly the Trump brand in elections that have happened over the past twelve months, federal elections, does not seem mm -hmm. to be doing very well. I mean, you know, losing a, a Senate seat in Alabama it's is, hard. is is pretty. <laughs> Tough for unless unless you're a disgusting individual, then then you can lose. I mean, if you're a pedophile, you're going to lose. Well, look, I mean, the, the reality is, if you run, if you run the, I mean, the 2016 race a hundred times, Hillary Clinton wins 90 at least. I mean, if you just do the numbers, I mean, um, he was able to overperform. How do we go to one of those alternate universes? Well, he was able, <laughs> he, he was able to overperform just enough with white voters. Right. And uh, she underperformed with non-white voters just enough. Now, why? There's infinite fascinating studies and books about this. I mean, it basically came down to probably four counties where this happened. Um, and to me, that's not an indication that the politics of relying on white voters is good politics. I think it's it's certainly morally bankrupt. But to me, it's sort of like you have a bunch of drinks at a party, you drive home safely, you get home safely, and you decide that alcohol helps you drive better. Like, probably the wrong conclusion. Um, just because it happened doesn't mean that it's causative. So I think that there, uh, what you've seen, I think, is a re-energized Democratic uh, base. And I think you're going to, if, if this is what I think what Dan is doing is so important, um, to have just around the margins enough of those who voted for Trump who will be motivated by other values they have, um, I, I think is very important. But I have to say also, you know, in those elections that that Republicans have lost, and let's use the special Roy, elections. The special elections. Yeah. So we'll use Roy Moore. I I think, other than us being racist and sexist, women, white educated women, yeah. Hillary Clinton, because I'm in that age group, that 35 to 55 year old age group of educated white women, looked at Hillary Clinton and said, "You are not the woman who's trying to help us, and you're the one Meaning who's." What? You're not, you're not lifting the glass ceiling. You're lifting it for you, and you're opening a little window for your own self. But you're not trying to get the rest of us up with you. And so where your staffers, where your campaign workers, where your daughter's friends, but we're not women that you are putting on the bench to run after you. 
And so I think that people, women voted for Trump because all of us have worked for a man like Donald Trump. We all understand how to navigate that system. And we've all worked for a woman like Hillary Clinton and all said, we're never working for another woman like that again. And so I think what happened was white women said, I'd rather go with him because I know that beast rather than working for that bitch. I mean, that's basically, you know, being in that, being in that realm of those women, that's how women really felt. They were, they were whispering, I'm gonna vote for him, because who cares about, the moral thing was kind of low on the totem pole of issues that they had. However, Roy Moore, women won't tolerate a man who is dating little girls. And so that's kind of a non-starter. So, but, I mean, I mean but, so, yeah, but, they but, still did. They still did because in Alabama, right? Their condition—that's a whole different mindset. But you're it, generalizing too much, though. I'm sorry. Not, not all women have worked for a man like Donald Trump. That's just. What, what, I, just not, I mean, I'm really? Sorry, I, can, I can. I can. I let me. Let me just tell you. There is not. There is nine out of ten men have looked at or made a woman who works for them feel uncomfortable in a business setting. You wear a short, you wear a, a dress, you wear, it's not Donald Trump, it's Donald Trump light. It's Donald Trump like. It's Donald Trump not on steroids, not the guy that, that said it, but it's, it's the person who makes you feel like that. Eight, out of, gonna, eight gonna, out of 10 women have been sexually it, that, yes, on the job. A, absolutely. So I mean, so it goes to the you're, you you get used to how to how to navigate that as opposed to the person who is just never going to help you. And you know, I, I think that women just rejected Hillary Clinton as a whole. If you look at the numbers, they didn't go out for Hillary. Well, Clinton. not uh, yeah, not women. Some white, white educated, women. white, right. not some. An enormous amount of white, overwhelming majority of white educated women did not vote for Hillary Clinton between the ages of 30, 35, and 50, 55. Right. So, and what could, what should she have done then to appeal to those people? So Hillary Clinton, during the convention, so I made my daughters and their friends sit and watch her speech. How old are your daughters? Um, 14, 12, 14, 11, and six. And so them and their friends, I made them all sit there. I shut the lights off. And I said, guys, we're going to watch something. And they were like, oh, cool, we're going to watch. And I put on the Democratic yeah. convention just as Clinton was coming out. The fun never ends. Oh, that. yeah, they were like, whoa, whoa, we're out of here. I was like, nope, you're all sitting down. And I told all your moms I was making you watch this. So you're all watching this. And she gave her speech. And at one point, she was talking about how she moved Chelsea into her room in Stanford, into the dorm, and how she pulled open the drawers, and she was cleaning everything out and putting all her stuff away. And I said, oh, see, if that Hillary Clinton plays through, she wins. And that Hillary Clinton left that in the convention hall and never came What do you mean? What, what is that Hillary it was, Clinton? It was, a, it was a softer side. It was a, I understand. I understand what you're going through. So remember, women in that age group that she lost, right, are if you're a white educated woman, chances are you have a career. You're trying to do be the superwoman. You're trying to work, you're trying to have your family, you're trying to be everything. And it's tough to do it. So you see a woman who's in power who says, I did it, I did it all. I, I totally get it. I know how hard it is. And that day that I sent my baby off to college and I you know, it was so emotional for me, and you're gonna have those emotional days. That's actually, that actually is something that women can understand, and then that went away. It, it totally, you know, she, she left it, and there was no emotion the rest of the time. And then, you know, it was the New York City, September 11th, you know, she wasn't feeling well, and instead of just sitting down, she lied about being sick. Right, so then it's like, well, now she's not. Now she's lying about being sick. Why? Because women can't be weak. We can't. We can't be sick. We can't be seen as not feeling well and having to sit down. And I think that that is that is why we're in this mess today, in 2018, is because there there haven't been women along the way, including her, to stand up for other women and say it's okay to have those moments of weakness. 
So she had that moment of weakness at the convention, and then it was gone. I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb and say you understand what it's like to be a white woman better than I do. Um, but <laughs> no, it, no, I it, 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 it seemed to me during the campaign that she was in a sort of between a rock and a hard place, because when she would show that, then there would be pushback against, like, well, that's why we can't have a woman as president. Well, she did win by 3 million votes. Right. right. Yeah. Which, right. Um, you know, and Bush, when I worked for Bush and we lost by half a million, we used to joke that, like, anybody can get elected president when you get more votes. You know, it's like professionals when you <laughs> lose by half a million. It's, it's not so funny now. Um, it is very, very difficult statistically, if you just run it through, to lose 3 million votes and, and win. And, it's very, and still win the Electoral College. Right. It is just mathematically uh, very, very difficult for that to happen. The probability, of, politics is all about probability. Is, you know, mm -hmm. And the probability of that happening is very remote. Um, which is why all the projections, the polling really wasn't that far off. They had Hillary Clinton winning pretty much with the margin that she did. It was just a little bit of where she lost, um, and where she underperformed. Um, and I think that's an important thing uh, to remember for Republicans. You know, the last time that we won the popular vote in the presidential election was 2004. 2004. Um, and that was the, the only time since 1998. And I, 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 you know, I did the Bush campaign to reelect. Um, and 88. Yeah. What did I say? 98. Yeah. 88. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Right, so 88, 88, 04, that's it. That's it. Yes. And uh, I did 2004, and I mean, w one of the things about Bush where I will say in our favor was w when you lose by half a million, you still get to win. It's very humbling. And you, you, we never thought that we had anything figured out. Uh, and we always approached it with great, um, that this is going to be very, very difficult. So um, on election night in 2004, um, it was, it really came down to Ohio. But it was a very closely held thing. I mean, if 75,000 votes had changed their mind, we would have lost. So it's not like we had cracked some code. Um, and it's, it's just increasingly difficult um, to be able to win those majorities. And I think it's very, very important I think in a debate about the electoral college, but just sort of as a country, I think it's important for the person who gets the most votes to win. Um, and uh, that's, that's, I think, going to be a real challenge here. Before we go to that with the audience, Dan, have you, your, your three daughters are all five or under. Mm -hmm. have you, do you talk to them at all about politics? Do they have any sense of what's happening? Not yet. They, they, they say Donald Trump is bad. Right. That's pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much the extent of it. Um, no, but to to you know to to kind of get bring it back a little bit. I mean, I think you know what we're just kind of talking about. Um, you know, number one, I'm an optimist. Okay, I, I think you know to to paraphrase the the big Lebowski, like nothing is f tier, dude. Okay, like we can. So if you're a Democrat and you want Donald Trump gone, well, Michigan was 12,000 votes, guys. So 12,000 votes. That's what you need to. You know, that's 6,000. You take away, you convince 6,000 people in Michigan not to vote. 6,001. 6,001. Okay, if you're a Democrat, that's your goal. Now, if you're a Republican, I think it's important to understand what is it about Trump that appeals to those white working class voters? Well, I'll tell you. I mean, I've been around these, you know, I'm a white working class, you know, not anymore. I'm a doctor now. But, you know, at one time I was, you know, a white working class military, and it is the chip on his shoulder. So if you want to save the Republican Party, you need to find someone who fights, someone who fights without all the other stuff. I mean, you know, I was telling Stewart on the way down, James Mattis would kick the crap out of Donald Trump in the heartland. You know, I'm, I don't know if he's going to run. You know, probably not. But you know, The Rock would kick the crap out of Donald Trump in the heartland. Uh, you know, but I mean, that's your challenge. So you know, what you know, people. He resonated with people for some reason. He resonated with folks who grew up as part of an honor culture. And um, you know, if you understand that, you can harness it for, for good, as I say. 
Um, all right, let's open it up uh, for questions. We have two microphones. If you could go up to one of the microphones. And um, we are recording this, and then we also post a transcript uh, later. So if you can just identify yourself so we can then say who you are instead of just random person. OK, my name is Ron Newman, and I'm a left-wing Democrat from Somerville. Um, <laughs> There are people who would argue that the trajectory that brought the Republican Party to where it is now with, the, with Trump started with Richard Nixon's Southern mm -hmm. strategy yeah. in the 1960s mm -hmm. when the Republicans decided instead of appealing to African Americans and you know, drawing on the history of how the Republican Party got founded, that they instead thought it would be better to appeal to white racists. Um, do you agree with this analysis? And if you don't, uh, tell me why you don't. Well, as a Southerner here, I'll jump into that. Um, you know, before 60, 64, the Republican presidential candidates could routinely get 30 to 35 percent of the African American vote, which is not great. But you get to 35, you can kind of see 40. Get to 40, you know, you're kind of feeling better. Um, and then it fell off a cliff, and it's never come back. Um, as an aside, if the same thing is happening with Hispanic voters, Republican parties do it. Uh, in Bush, we got up to 43% in 2004. Um, uh, Trump and uh, Romney both got about 27%. Um, but it's 27, 27% of a increasing share. Yeah. So if you got the same 27%, you're getting fewer votes. Um, I. I think that you have to sort of be honest, uh, and if you're, you're somebody like me, it's frankly difficult and painful, that there's a lot of truth to what you said. Um, I think the great failure of the Republican Party pre-Trump was to appeal to African American voters, the modern Republican Party. Um, and uh, I worked for a lot of candidates who worked really hard uh, to do better, and, and it's frustrating. And there's an interesting phenomenon that African-American Republican candidates don't tend to do better with African-Americans. So it's not just a question of uh, having someone uh, run. Um, it's, I, I think it's a moral imperative to acknowledge it and to do better. But I'll be damned if I know the road to that. Is it, is it not appealing, or was it not appealing to African American voters or appealing to white races? I mean, you talked about Mississippi burning, and Reagan had the famous Neshoba Neshoba County, County, County Fair where he, where he you know, yeah, eight you miles know, from can, where I the can argue, were. Listen, I, I, um, I, I, I was there, uh, and I grew up going to Neshoba County Fairs. Um, I don't, I, I might be naive about this. I did not see that fraught with symbolism to go to Neshoba County. No, but to go to Neshoba County and talk about states' rights. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I think it was, to me, it was different than the tone that Trump has. Um, oh, right. But that's, a, and, that's, and that's, that's I, not even a low bar. That's like, I mean. I didn't. I, 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 personally, I, I, it is so different than, uh, what made the Shelby County, fam what made the Shelby County famous was the three civil rights workers, you know, Sworno, Cheney, and Goodman were buried in the Shelby County. Um, though everyone from the Shelby County will point out that the people who did it were not from the Shelby County. Um, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't see that uh, as uh, being the dog whistle that it, that it often is. I mean, when you look at Clinton uh, Gore when they ran, it was oh, a sure, different kind of a different kind of Democrat. Super predators. I and mean, there was there well, were dog whistles on both sides. Different kind of Democrat turned out to be like you know you were for the death penalty. You were going to end welfare. Right. I mean they they campaigned with Confederate flags. Um, I don't know. I, 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 these things are never uh, perfect. They're never one thing or the other. And I think degree matters a lot. Um, Can I hear from the other two all on this question, too? I'm, I'm sorry? I just wanted to hear from yeah. the three of you. Um, I mean, 
Abe Lincoln is my favorite president ever. And so I, for me, I hold out, I'm an optimist, I hold out hope in the fact that um, we are not this racist party and we are able to kind of come out of this. This was a temporary glitch for us. And I think that the way, I know the way I think it changes is by electing more women to office because I think if we start electing more women to office and kind of generationally push out some of the older members of Congress, bring in more women, the conversation changes and we can actually, the only way the Republican Party is gonna change if we're starting to appeal to women and minorities and we, we're not doing a great job of it right now. Is the Republican Party racist? I mean, I think. So the question was about the Southern strategy. Right. <laughs> Where that is, where this is where we've led, started. right? Um, no, but some of the people in it are, you know, and and, and enough to elect Donald Trump, who is is clearly racist. Yeah. Hi, uh, Rowan Jacobson. I'm a Knight Fellow at MIT, um, and a Fellow of Vermonter Dance. So uh, you just mentioned The Rock, kind of half jokingly, and I think that kind of begs the question that whenever. Donald Trump exits the stage, mm. do things go back to normal, like normal politics, or has, are we about mm. to enter some brand new thing that we can't even really predict what it's gonna be yet? Like, do career politicians have a future running for president? I think we're all, we're all three of you. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, I certainly hope so. Um, I think that Trump has demonstrated, you know, one of the, one of the problems with the, the Trump administration from the get-go is, that, you know, it's amateur hour over there, right? You know, the, there's a dearth of professional expertise, and that's, that turns out to be really important. You know, you can't have your son-in-law just have the back-channel <laughs> embassy communications with the Soviets, right? So, um, you know, does it go back to, um, you know, how it was before? Well. You know, I, I, th I think it will. Um, I, think, I think celebrity lends an advantage to someone who is thinking of running for office. Um, you know, that, but I'd be curious what Stuart has to say about that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and I'll just weigh in. When Oprah, when it was rumored that Oprah was going to run, what I was hearing from Democrats that I work with was, Oh God, I hope not. <laughs> we, we see what having a celebrity being in office does. Not that Oprah's not a wonderful woman who has had a great career, but just I think that we need to go back to governors and senators running for president people and not- People who run things. Yeah, people that actually know. I mean, you know, whether you like Mike, Mike Pence or you don't like Mike Pence, he's been a, a member of Congress and he's been a governor. So, you know, he actually understands policy and politics. And I think that that's, he, he's one of the very few people that's in there that actually gets it. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Hi, I'm, I'm Roger Wilson, and uh, uh, I'm a Republican. And uh, I, I, um, I think Dan's really onto something on the honor culture. My son was in the military and served in Iraq, and uh, um, uh, I, I identify with what he's saying. But uh, uh, David Brooks had a, a column recently uh, saying that you guys are, uh, uh, the, the never Trump folks have to address the uh, grievances or interests that um, uh, our, uh, that the uh, Trump voter has in order to um, uh, to defeat Trump, and I, I would say honor the honor culture. That's an interest. It's it's the way people see their own self interest is their values. But there's also a whole set of uh, of uh, uh, more substantive, I think, uh, grievances that a lot of people had. I, when I attended the caucus in Massachusetts uh, was when I thought Trump would, would potentially win, and that was in the spring. And the Trump people were the most normal people in the room, in the Republican caucus. They were like Patriots fans. Mm. You know, uh, uh, successful plumbers, 
uh, et cetera, and the guy leading the fight, and they were very well organized, the guy leading the fight was a, a ex-military guy. Had everybody organized perfectly. They got all the delegates, not only for, uh, for the Trump vote, but they voted Trump people into all the other uh, allocated delegates. So they, they were really well organized. And that was in Massachusetts. So I wonder what, do you agree with David Brooks? Do you have some ideas about beyond the honor interest, what other interests are not being served by the establishment that um, you would uh, respond to and appeal to the Trump voter? Well, I mean, one of the ironies when you talk about Trump, I think Trump is, is very much an establishment. There's nothing more establishment than inherited wealth. Yeah. And here's a guy who's inherited wealth who lives on Fifth Avenue. Um, and it's why I don't think Trump really is a populist. Um, I, I think that you can get those voters without the darkness that Trump brings. I mean, certainly when Bill Well ran in Massachusetts, we got those voters. Um, and uh, when Salucci ran, I, I guess when Mitt ran, I didn't work on well, Mitch, Mitt's government. Yeah, I, so I think that there um, is a way to speak to them uh, that isn't about grievance, but about aspiration. And I think that it's an obligation in a civil society uh, to try to appeal to that which makes us better, not what need, you need to do to win. Now, I say that as someone who's just been focused on winning for a lot of years, and I've won a lot of races. But um, I, I don't think if you ask those people, uh, are you, do you like what Trump said about women? I don't think a single, very few of them would at least admit it. I don't think they do. They're like decent, good people. And that's the danger of electing someone like Trump, because it begins to, as, to use a word that's used a lot, normalize it. Um, and I, I think these intangibles are very important. I think it's very important to have role models that you can look at. And I disagreed with Barack Obama on a lot of policy stuff. Uh, I worked against him. Um, but I think he's a very admirable person. I think he is. And you can look at, at Barack Obama and feel better about America and, feel, and, and point to him as someone you might disagree with. But um, this is a good and decent family. And I think that that those little things uh, are really important. And uh, I don't, you, you look at candidates across the country, and governors are, are particularly good. No one's, I don't, very few people are running like Donald Trump. And I think that's telling. It's, and when people like Donald Trump run, run and they, they run, they tend to lose. Oh, age. So he won, yeah. Um, but, there are not a lot of them. And uh, I think that that's telling. So I think the fact that Trump did win and does represent this darkness is not definitive that that is the way to go to win. Uh, my name is Doug. I, I coach here at MIT. Full disclosure, I'm a registered Democrat. Um, just a Quick question. I tend to be long-winded. I'm going to try to be as succinct as I possibly can. Um, but before I even say anything, I'm just curious, what does the panel feel about what happened with the Supreme Court pick? I don't mean who was picked. I mean... What, what, what are you referring to words, what, what, when Obama what, was... No, when the Senate refused to bring it to the floor. Right. When Obama was president. Correct. I'm just curious, how did you guys feel about that? Me personally, it seemed like... Uh kind of a violation of the, the spirit of the, of the thing. I mean, I think the, you know, what makes us all Americans, or what should make us all Americans, and, and part of the problem with the whole Trump thing is, you know, our, our loyalty should be to the rules of the game. You know, when you're a military officer, you take an oath to, to the Constitution, right? So, you know, you, you, have to, you have to conduct yourself and accept the results. You know, you have to... Um, you know, the chips fall where, where you know, and y y you play your hand. Um, so to me, I think it was kind of a low blow, if you want to use that term, or, or what have you. Yeah, 
Yeah, you know, it's un it's unfortunate politics, right? I mean, it's it, politics is a blood sport, and I got a history degree. I've worked on the Marist poll. I know a lot about politics. Yeah, no, I'm. And, and I'm I, I'm not. So I'm not. There's one other U.S. president where anything like that has ever happened. Yeah. Like, no. I, I mean, you know, look. The so. the Senate was in control. They were able to do what they wanted to do, right? And they they decided that that was whether it was right or wrong. I don't agree with what they did. Um, I think it was. You know, he had. He still had the right to make his nomination, and it should have been. It should have gone. Th you know, gone through. And Trump is going to have plenty of time to nominate other. Supreme Court justices. Did you did you say at the time that you didn't agree with it? Um, I don't know if I was ever asked publicly about it. But you didn't say anything publicly. You didn't say you disagreed with it. I mean, I don't know if well, my opinion doesn't matter. I mean, here in Massachusetts, but I mean, I don't know if I said whether I did or not. I mean, you know, and sometimes you look at it and say, well, it should be up to the next person, but. Did it happen to Bush? It happened. To, did, it, mm -mm. did it happen at some no. point? Uh -uh. The closest is in no. the 1800s. There was yeah. a similar okay. situation where Congress is really, you know. No, but wasn't there? Was long. there an opening? Before Not on another, the court. Another no. person. Okay. The closest is when Joe Biden famously said yes, after that. Yes, that's that that's what it is. That was also in October or November. Not, you, Right. Little, little, I disagree with Joe Biden at the time, frankly. Right. But. Right. And I think that was the one thing that I had said was, well, Biden said it. So I mean, you know, if Biden said it, then Biden's now vice president. And so what's good for the goose is good for the gander. But really, proceed, True. Proce February. procedurally, yeah. it should have been that at least, you know, he went through. I guess the reason why I ask that, because I think it speaks to some of the problems that we're having in the whole mm -hmm. political system, is that, um, you know, I, I guess because I studied in college, I, I kind of intimately know what was in the minds of the framers of, of our Constitution more than most. Um, and we're very lucky because I don't think it would ever happen again, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. But I think part of, part of this whole, when it comes to politics and, and the way our society is moving, is you have to accept, OK, society is moving in this direction. And this is how it goes. Um, but anyways, I was just curious. I, I, and I, but you know, I'm, but I do. I, I'm because it speaks to my next point. A, but a big going. constitutionalist, and I think of it as it's a separation of powers, right? So right. the president could make his recommendation. The Senate is a separate branch, right? Right. So they can do whatever they want with the judiciary, you know, and the judiciary well, true, is separate. True. So, they, so they, realistically, I mean, if they decide that they don't want, if they want to punt it for however long they want to punt it for. I, it doesn't look good. It doesn't smell good. It's also not what was intended. I mean, that's just not, that's not how it was supposed to work. You know. Um, anyways, um, I, it leads in kind of my point, because I think part of the issue, and, and Jennifer, you mentioned term limits. Um, I personally, I think you know, that that's a possible solution or, or part of the solution. But I think the biggest issue is the never-ending campaign cycle. Um, the fact that we're talking about 2020 not just now, but we've been talking it since before the election was even over. Um, and the lobbyist and the money in the campaigns, it's just, it's just uh, detrimental to the entire practice. So I, I guess my question to the panel is also, because you, you all nodded your heads and you seem to agree with what I just said, how do we get away from that? Because Come I think us. that is killing us. <laughs> And, and frankly, one thing that I thought about this election is I thought whoever won this election is going to lose the next one. We're overdue for an economic crash, et cetera. I mean, who knows? Um, but just the fact that we're all talking about 2020, who cares about 2020? I mean, yeah, let's look down the road at everything, but let's, let's focus on what our problems are now, and that's what we need to focus on, because otherwise it's not going to work. Um, so I'll, I'll step away from the mic here, because I've been talking too long. but. But another question I, I guess I was going to have, and one of the reasons why I came to this forum is, you know, I, I, I'm glad to see people, Republicans, who are not happy with what's going on with the presidency. A lot of the Republicans I talk to um, just keep on supporting Trump no matter what, which is extremely frustrating. And they keep on saying, well, it's better than Hillary. It's like, I don't care who won the election. Let's just pay attention to what's happening now. Mm -hmm. You don't, just because you're not happy, or just because 
it's okay to say you're not happy with what's going on and you voted for that person. That's okay. You know, let's, let's try to fix what's going mm -hmm. on because I think more of us, if we admit it to ourselves, we might be able to do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess, so that's my question is, what are you guys going to do? You guys have the keys to everything. You're in control of everything. I mean, I, I, if they were in control of everything, as, when I say they, I'm talking about the Republican <laughs> GOP Republicans. Um, and one thing, as much as his politics actually frighten me more, and his policies and fiscal policies and his political views, I would much rather have Mike Pence in there and impeach this president because I don't think he's going to get us in a nuclear war. And he does have some sort of understanding of the process and understands that, you know, you can't just be firing off Twitter, you know, things. So I, I guess my, my question to you guys as I leave is, what are we going to do about it? Because this is a real problem. Well, let's say one thing. I, 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 would, I would support um, federal funding for all federal elections. I've really become radicalized on this. Um, and, you know, there seems to be about 10 of us in the country, so it's not looking good. Um, and campaign finance is one of these things, if you think about it for five minutes, it seems easy. And if you think about it for 15, it seems impossible. Because um, there's a lot of arguments on both sides and a lot of laws of unintended consequences. But I've worked in a lot of other countries and looked at different systems. And I, and I would go to a federal funding for uh, all federal elections with limits. I mean, everybody gets the same amount of dollars, mm -hmm. regardless of your party, et cetera. And that's it, no mm -hmm. fundraising, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I go back to term limits, because if you limit the U.S. Senate to two terms, that's 12 years. In term number two, they stop going out with the lobbyists. They stop you know, being wined and dined. They don't need to do the fundraising. They don't need the special interest. So I think that term limits solves a lot of it. Plus, you get turnover. Getting new ideas is always good. Again, you know, any company, even a university, someone's tenured, someone else comes in. If you're in a company, someone's an associate moves up the ladder, and that's really healthy and good to continuously have new blood come in, which we don't have unless there are vacancies or someone is actually beatable. But the flip side is if you have someone really good and they have to leave. Yeah, well, you know what? So you run again, no, you know, I, 12 years later or eight years later. But I mean, I think. That, that actually it regenerates itself a lot by being able to do that. Tom? Hi, I'm Tom Levinson. I'm a professor here. I am a yellow dog Democrat. Um, and uh, first thing is I want to say thank you to the panel because even though I think I disagree on almost everything <laughs> that uh, the Republicans have attempted to do and are doing over many years, I think there's plenty of empirical evidence that almost all the policy choices are bad. Um, you know, A, we need two parties functioning, and B, it's, you know, it's not easy being a Republican opposing um, not just the president, but the entire leadership apparatus. And I, we need all hands on deck if this, you know, it's not just a dark moment for the Republican Party, it's a dark moment for the country, and I'm very glad you're, you're doing what you're doing here and, and, and in your other work. Um, but, and perhaps it's because I'm a yellow dog Democrat, uh, it seems like the pathology of the Republican Party has, has been something that, you know, it's not just that the, the issue of race was, became a problem in 68. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, sort of, you know, the, the effect that the same, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's like a habituation to a drug, you know, sort of, Dog whistling in '68 uh, becomes, um, you know, uh, bow-legged Mexicans with water, you know, you know, et cetera. It's all the horrible things that that, you know, uh, King of Iowa and others have been saying, and Trump has amplified, um, you know, and and on and on through a number of the issues that that the Republicans have, uh, the Republican official party, the the platform, a uh, large number of candidates have signed on to. Um, has been a real, you know, that, that's been growing and growing and growing. And frankly, the talent in the party. I mean, you talk about the Democrats having nobody to run. Um, you know, that, that gang of 16 wasn't exactly enormously impressive, I have to no. say. Um, and you have people, um, you know, you've had, during the Obama years, you had people being rewarded for uh, both awful and obtuse things like the Benghazi nonsense. Mm. Um, and so on and so forth. 
So I got to ask you, I know it's really hard to leave a, a, a childhood faith, as it were, um, but you haven't, you haven't been convincing tonight that the Republican Party is either saving or worth, is savable or worth saving. Um, and I guess I want to ask you is how seriously you've considered, you know, whether or not the Republicans are now where the pre-war Democrats were mm -hmm. in 18, you know, 58 and 9, and whether something else has to be done. Well, um, if Donald Trump is a Republican Party, it's not a party that I would be drawn to. Um, I think it's up to voters to decide what the Republican Party is going to be. Um, I think this talent question that you, you or the point that you made, I think is a very good one. And if the Republican Party becomes a party that is the anti-science party, that is the uh, white grievance party, that is uh, a party um, that isn't for uh, aspirational education. And we have a resentment toward those who are educated and not instead of aspiring to be better educated. Um, you're basically against the future because the, and the future ultimately doesn't care what you think. It's going to happen. And, um, you know, if you're against uh, the future, uh, at some point you're going to lose and you're not going to become relevant. And I think that's the essential point, question for the party. What is its relevance? Uh, and you turn on Fox and you get a sense that maybe Hillary Clinton's going to lose the election. Um, it's, it's not really... Uh, relevant to anything that is about the future. Um, and that's what the party has to decide. I mean, the party at its heyday was founded as a, not founded, but I mean, the modern party at its heyday, if you look at Reagan and 144 states, you know, what did that party stand for? Uh, in many ways, the party, you could argue, and some have articulated very eloquently, that the party's a victim of its own success. That it was, uh, the uh, crime is down. It was, a, it was a law and order party. It was a anti-Soviet Union party. Stand up to them. There's no more Soviet Union. Um, it was uh, a, a party that felt that welfare had gone to an extreme. And welfare certainly, thanks to Bill Clinton, has changed. Um, and there are a lot of those issues that the, you won. So then what else are you going to, that's the great challenge. What are you going to be for? Um, I know in 2000 in the Bush campaign, really the only thing that we did that worked, I mean, I'm talking about sitting there watching numbers, was restoring honor and dignity to the White House. We put tax stuff up there, it didn't move a thing. Um, and it was about this question of, of character. Um, and I think that that's really what the party has to decide, um, what it wants to be. And we always say uh, that you have to stand for something other than election. And now you have to sort of see if you really believe that. So um, I, have, I became a Republican to the dismay of my um, retired bus driver union grandfather and my seamstress union grandmother, who we lived with, they were horrified. Um, and it was because I worked my butt off and I saw kids around me getting handouts and I was pissed because my dad died and I got nothing and I didn't have a parent. And for me, it was being a Republican it was all about hard work, it was all about if you work hard, you get rewarded. It was about limited government and people staying out of your business. And I'm inherently a 16-year-old girl that doesn't want anyone to tell me what to do. So don't tell me what to do with my money. Don't tell me what to do with my body. <laughs> Just leave, leave me alone and go on your merry way. And so I 
one, am a Republican. I'm never, I won't change that regardless of who the president is and how much I disagree with them. What I will do is teach my kids and my kids' friends about what the party actually stands for, is supposed to stand for, and to fight to get it back. Um, and I think that you know one of the challenges is to make sure that people fight for what they believe in and really believe in and stop laying down and let people run, in, run over us with their own beliefs. And so what's happening right now is a lot of us feel like we were mowed down and I just keep saying, well, it's like whack-a-mole, like hit me down, come back up, hit me down, come back, I really don't care. I'm gonna sti still be here as a thorn in your side, but I don't, I I'm not a Democrat. I don't believe in the principle, so I'm not gonna change over to the left, um, I, but I, I think that our party needs to get back to what we believe in, the, the, the tax, what just happened and, and the deficit and the budget that went through. I mean, it's like you want to vomit. We're leaving my kids and grandkids, all of our kids and grandkids, with such enormous debt that how do you even get out of it? None of us would have a credit card bill laying around like that. How do we leave that for our kids? So anyway. I appreciate what you say about you know being a Republican forever and not agreeing, not becoming a Democrat. But I didn't ask you if you would become a Democrat. I'd ask you if if um, the Republican Party, as it is, not as you wish it to be, but as it is, so completely fails to represent what you believe in and what you aspire to. What do you do about that? It's not become a Democrat. You fight. You fight. But suppose I mean Trump gets reelected and. You know, the tax bill, I have said the most recent tax bill is, is, is egregious but consistent with several iterations of Republican tax bills. This isn't a new thing. So, um, it, so you know, so I, 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 I mean, it seems to me like, you know, you're, you are the counterpart to, to the true yellow dog Democrats who would vote for him. I, I was joking when I called myself that. Um, I actually voted for Bill Will this first election, not the second time. Bill Will carried Cambridge. What's that? Will carried Cambridge in 90. I remember. People's so Republic of Cambridge. That was the quality of his opponent, I have to say. John, you, you yeah, were so yeah. that, always, <laughs> that always helps. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm really a little perplexed by so, your... So, again, I think the only way it comes back... Donald Trump is completely generationally different than I am, right? I'm going to be here a lot longer than he is. And so, <laughs> hope to God. Um, and and I, I created three other beings like myself that are generationally substantially different than me. So you know, my feeling is if each of us can affect one other life and change one other life to go out there and fight for what we believe in, then the world can be a better place. And so my belief is if I can take out all of the elderly, white, racist males and, <laughs> and, and, and replace them with you know, women, younger women, who actually have an idea of what goes on in the world and what's needed, we're going to change the party over and over. It's not, it's not stuck. I don't believe it's stuck. Donald Trump is only a temporary little glitch on the radar screen. He's out, and then there's another generation that will, by the time he's out, be so pissed off that they're going to motivate and change what the party looks like. That's my hope. Did you want to jump in? I was going to say, I, I preface my answer with, <coughs> I'm not a Republican, but um, I'm not a Democrat either. But uh, the, uh, you know, I, I think the Republican Party, looking at it from the outside, um, it's a conservative party. And if you want to sort of rebrand re republicanism, um, you know, you need to get back to the back to the basics. I mean, there's plenty about America that is should be conserved. There's plenty that's great about our country that should be conserved. Um, you know, the thing that's always one thing that's always baffled me about you know kind of how the political parties align themselves. I mean, you know, for example, the environment. You know, a conservative should want to conserve the environment. You know, um, things like that. You know, there's plenty that is good and wonderful about America. And I believe that, and I think most of the people in this room probably believe that too. And, you know, and, and conserving what is good is how the Republican Party gets back to business. Yeah. 
Great, thanks. Um, I'm not here to beat up on you, um, <laughs> but I actually am going to ask you to elaborate on kind of some of these earlier points. Um, uh, my name is Earl Wagner. I am um, an MIT alum. Now I'm working in California in technology. And that kind of gives rise to some, like, some of the perspective that I was bring, or I do bring. Um, you know, during the 2016 election, there was a lot of talk about uh, coal miners um, and, you know, coal jobs. And meanwhile, in Silicon Valley, we're saying, like, well, what about the 20 to 30 million jobs that are dis can disappear from, like, self-driving trucks, you know? Um, just seeing yesterday that in terms of, of um, party affiliate or party, um, um, I guess, affiliation, uh, looking at the breakdown, uh, looking at millennials, in particular millennial women, there's a 47% difference. So you're talking about 75% to 25% in terms of party affiliation. So I'm really curious, building on the last question, um, you know, I heard, Stuart, you mentioning some of the core values around individual responsibility, individual freedom. Uh, Jennifer, you mentioning like hard work and being able to see the sort of results of your hard work. And then Daniel, like talking about, um, you know, communities where there's a real focus on honor. I'm curious, like what, um, are you seeing like, uh, uh, like um, policies or are you seeing like how, like what kind of messages do you think would appeal to, or like would really speak to, you know, the techies in California, the millennials who are looking at, uh, you know, who just take for granted, you know, gay marriage, take for granted like, uh, you know, legal marijuana, take for granted, uh, you know, uh, working, interacting with folks who may not be documented. Like what, what, what do you see as a kind of, um, how do you see that these ideals might be embodied in messages that kind of resonate for, for these folks? So your, your well, specific, I, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I mean, I, I, this whole, I am absolutely baffled by this beating up of California that Trump is in. I mean, California, first of all, you know, <laughs> If you take a state like Mississippi, it, it, we, we get four tax dollars back for every one we give. So without California, Mississippi would sort of blow away. Um, and it, it's the single most successful state, without a doubt. I mean, it's, it's huge, it's problematic, but I mean, it is um, a, and has long embodied sort of the future of America. And I just go back to that, you have to embrace this. Um, and. It, it uh, people that work in these diverse communities, as, as you know, you know, uh, well, are not frightened by this. This idea, for the most part, there's always exceptions. It's um, it's this otherness, the sphere of the unknown, the sphere of the future, that I think that the Republican Party um, has to get away from. Uh, any party does if it's going to exist. Um, I'm not as optimistic, personally. <laughs> I'd like to be. Um, but um, I'm, I'm not as optimistic, because I don't necessarily see the path clearly forward. But um, I'm wrong a you lot. You see the path forward for the country or for the party? No, for the party. Um, I mean, I just look at the numbers. So Trump is a 20% favorable among under 30s. Um, if Trump is president, as you know, Jim says for six years. And then it's not just going to be, if, even if Trump lost in 2020 to a Democrat, the Trump element of the party is going to be there to deal with. Um, and I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's very troubling. Uh, it, and, and I'm all for fighting, and I love the fight, and I fight a lot. But I'm very uh, s sober about the prospects of it. I mean, I almost want to offer reassurance. I mean, the, the values that all three of you articulate, I think, are really powerful and really compelling. And it's, I um, mean, you know, you mentioning uh, individual freedom, individual responsibility. For me, it's just this kind of curiosity about what that might look like, you know, in mes political messages 10 or, or 20 years down the road. It's a really good question. Yeah. I think generationally it changes. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I just think that once Trump is gone, he surrounded himself by men that wanted to retire, and this was the last hurrah in their careers. As we see, they're being shuffled out you know, daily, and I think that by the time he's done, he's going to have gone through all of them. And it's just going to be, you know, there's not going to be any other you know, billionaire, white, you know, 78-year-old to be hanging out in the cabinet anymore. 
And I think that you know we are, again, it's going to be a turnover. And you see by the numbers of women, historical numbers of women are running in 2018 for seats. Whether they win or lose, it doesn't matter. Women are now mobilized. And women do see that there's a need to start getting involved. And I think that that's how it changes because you know, I, I always laugh, like my, my recycling is like the neatest recycling in the entire world. I rinse everything, my kids are nuts about it, we, not, we, we take care of everything, right? And um, I, I laugh when you know, people say that there's no climate change in the party and then it's February and I'm walking around in flip flops because it's 70 degrees on a random day in New England. Um, and so I think that it's just going to take a new generation to come up there. I mean, and that's maybe the, like, I'm 46. So for me, you know, I, I laugh. I'm young in my business until I'm like 60. <laughs> so I, I feel like I, there's still plenty of time for people like myself and younger to make changes in the party going forward and, and have real appreciation for technology. Have, I, when he was talking about coal miners, like my great grandfather worked in a coal mine. Right? That's antiquated. Going forward is what your business and what you're up to. I agree with all that. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name's David Wu. I'm an undergrad at MIT. Um, so Jennifer, like you, I think that in the way things are going, Trump's going to win again. And I'd really not like to have six more years of that. So the only way that I see that happening is moderates from both sides um, come together and agree on some fundamental principles about what we want in our government. And I'm, I can understand how like college educated voters also voted for Trump. And I understand that in 2016. And I think the goal should be to try to convince them not to vote again um, the next time around. And I think that you've, you've used sexist a lot and you've thrown it out. And I totally agree with you. His comments, despicable, like unacceptable. But I think in terms of a unifying way of convincing uh, moderate Republicans to go away from Trump, that these attacks on Donald Trump's character are not the most effective way because then you're implying that voters who voted for Trump also share some of these characteristics. And I definitely know that's not true. I have friends and parents of friends who voted for Donald Trump, and I will speak to their character. And it's not true. And I think it's almost harmful if we just use these emotional appeals all the time. like. The undermining of the justice system, and we're supposed to have separation of powers. If you believe in the American government system, we're supposed to have separation of powers. And the constant undermining of the judicial system, uh, the constant undermining of the freedom of the press is a huge, two huge fundamental issues that I think everyone, if you believe in the American government system, can support. Uh, this fake news, you don't need to believe the news. You can read multiple news sources. So this fake news nonsense has been just like, I don't understand it all. Just read multiple sources if you want a whole picture on something. So do you think if you just stick to these principles of um, separation of powers, <coughs> believing the Constitution and the freedom of the press, uh, these tariffs and these trade wars I don't think have ever helped the consumer, the economy, and the history of America, do you think if you just stick to those three principles, it's enough to get moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats decide together? Or now in the social media age is where everything's in a tweet and everything's in a 10 second video clip. Do you think that message will get lost and there's no, honestly, no hope? So I'm just going to start because I, I think he's a sexist. I don't think that that's a winning message. No. I think he's a sexist. I, I agree with you. And, but and in full disclosure, my mother, not only did she vote for Donald Trump, which was like, oh, God. Not only did she vote for him, that's fine that she voted for him, but she is like, I can't talk to her. If I disagree with one thing that Trump, so my problem with her voting for him was not that she voted for Trump, because I, I have lots of friends that voted for him. Um, it was, it's her adamancy about, 
you know, well, mom, you have granddaughters. Would you want him to talk about them like that? Mom, you were a single woman. You worked in a business with lots of men. You were, men came on to you. It's like none of that actually even matters to her. And she just, she loves Donald Trump. So I mean, the sexism thing is my own hang up about him. Yeah. Um, but I think that there are, there are people on both sides of the aisle that would really like to see, they didn't like Bernie Sanders and they didn't like any of the Republicans. And there has to be a more moderate message. The problem is the primary system. Yeah. The primary system pulls everyone to the right and everyone to the left. And then they lose. I mean, that was one of the problems with Hillary, was that because she was going against Bernie, she got pulled so far to the left that it was very difficult for her to find where she was always playing kind of in the middle. And so we need a message like that. I mean, I think what's going on now with the tariffs and the trade war, once that starts hurting middle America, that will define a message really quickly. Ed? Hi, uh, Ed Birchinger, faculty member here. I have a question about the possibility for depolarization. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around values and the hope that perhaps values can be, that there exists perhaps apolitical or cross-party cross values that might bring people together. And of course, I remember a time 20 years ago, 40 years ago, when comedy was uh, celebrated um, practice, uh, certainly at least within the Senate, and we did have a primary system back then. Um, one thing I've observed is that a lot of people on the left reacting to Trump are doing so in a values framework, um, particularly young people. Is there a prospect for uh, people to come together with, with concepts of basic values, and you've enumerated a great set that I think would cross the political spectrum, for diminishing some of this extreme polarization that we have and bringing us back to a little bit of cross-party comedy? Well, Dan, I mean, I think this is a lot of what you're about. Yeah, I mean, yeah it, you know, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think, you know, the common experience, you know, the, the entire, you know, idea of the organization that, that we've started was um, that common experience is going to trump, you know, sort of different, pardon the pun, but, you know, the, the, the different, the differenceness, um, you know, so, so, you know, what, what I think, you know, about veterans and veterans coming home is we all have this shared experience of serving in the military. Not everyone, not all veterans have been in combat, you know, but um, we all at least have that shared experience of having been sort of inculcate, having these values inculcated into us and, and the importance of a team and, you know, the team is more important than self. Um, there are other things like that. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, it's the commonalities that you know I think need to to sort of be emphasized, and and I think that that is possible. I mean, I think young people have a lot more in common um, with each other, whether they're on the left or the right, uh, than they do with their grandparents. You know, and I think that um, you know uh, some of the generational factors are are gonna gonna work there, and and um, so yes, I, I do think there's a way. For, uh, but it, but it, like all of these things, it takes work. You know, this is, um, you know, someone needs to stand up and, you know, reach across the aisle and be the first one to do it, and then be the second one to do it, and then be the third one to do it. And that is not happening right now. I think we have time for one more question, probably. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cecilia Bjaran. I'm uh, a visiting fellow at MIT from Norway representing a small group of Norwegian there. <laughs> so we find this Norway. very interesting because, well, uh, Trump is also kind of a president for us because the US is our big brother in many ways. And I think it was quite a shock when we woke up in the morning and found out that what seemed to be impossible actually happened. And it has changed also um, the way politics is done in Norway and the view we have on the world. And that this is more a question to all three of you because I do realize that probably foreign policy is not the most important concern uh, for in politics in the US. But on the other hand, 
we are used for the president of the U.S. to be a stabilizing factor, mm -hmm. also for us. What we see now is that it's the total opposite. And um, I was living in a time where we were squeezed between the Soviet Union and the U.S., and we were afraid of nuclear war wars, and you are probably the same, that we learned how to protect ourselves, how to get down on the floor and whatever to protect ourselves from nuclear weapons. But what we see now is that the new generation actually is starting to get afraid of exactly the same things that we thought were gone for so many years. So is this an issue in the US or could it be an issue and will it have any impact or could it have any impact in the next uh, election? Well, statistically, foreign policy, you're right, is not a, a big election. You know, before, in 2012, uh, when I was running for the Romney campaign, the, there was three debates between Obama and Romney, and the third was supposed to focus on foreign policy, did focus on foreign policy. So we just did a poll before, um, how many people are interested in foreign <laughs> policy? It seemed sort of irrelevant. And uh, in only 7% thought it was one of their top 10 issues. Oof. Wow. Which is like, in a way, in a, in a way you can argue that's, that's positive and that when we tend to be involved in foreign policy is when we're fighting a war. Um, certainly in Vietnam, those numbers would have been very different. Uh, and I think at the beginning of the Iraq invasion, certainly it would have been different. Um, but I think one of the great, uh, disasters of Trump is his failure to understand or appreciate uh, the st need for stability in the world and the U.S. central role in that. And that we've, the whole post-war uh, alliance that we have built that has kept peace for the most part, um, I think is in jeopardy. And uh, it is, you can put all of this stuff together, and that could very well be the most troubling uh, and lasting legacy of Trump. Um, and I don't see him, he, he has an extraordinary inability to learn. <laughs> and um, most presidents get better, um, but he's not. And uh, that doesn't bode well. Before we end, one, one, I guess I'll reserve my right as moderator to ask one final question. Um, uh, before he signed the Civil Rights Act, LBJ famously said that he was, uh, um, he was gonna lose the South for Democrats for generations to come, uh, which in many ways ended up being true. Um, it, it, do you think it is necessary for a Republican leader to make a similar type of principled stand uh, where they say that short-term political calculus is uh, going to be against this, but I'm going to do this for the identity of the party? Um, and a corollary to that question is, what would that stand be? Well, I, I, I think uh, in many ways this is what Mitt Romney did when he gave the speech about Donald Trump. There's certainly nothing in it for him. Um, and uh, I am, have been surprised and saddened that more of that hasn't happened. Um, I, I, I think it's a great failure of this moment. Um, and I think we'll look back on it and ask that same question why it didn't, because I think it'll seem very obvious. Um, it'll seem very obvious that it should have happened? or It should have happened. Right. Um, I, I don't have a, a, a good answer for that. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it'll be forced by a crisis. Like in, you know, some, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, you saw Lisa Murkowski mm -hmm. and Susan Collins 
Lindsey Graham, John McCain. I mean, you know, to me, they're heroes. They that they stood up when no one else was standing up to say this is wrong and we're not agreeing. Um, you know, healthcare or Rubio, you know, Lindsey Graham, Grassley. You know, the whole um, on the on Mueller. Um, I I think also it's going to take some kind of unfortunate tragedy for anyone else to, to find the nerve to stand up. Um, and it's really concerning because I was married on September 8th of 2001. I was one of the 30 flights in the air on September 11th that couldn't land because we were over the Pacific Ocean. So I landed on my honeymoon finding out that New York was never going to be the same. I grew up in New York. 78 people from my hometown died that day. Tons of our friends were in the Trade Center. Friends of mine were pregnant, jumping on the back of garbage trucks to get out of town. So like that is an actual serious, real, real feeling that I have and, and concern that I have that you know, raising kids in this crazy world, what happens? And so um, I, I think that that's when people stand up and finally realize and get out of their bubbles. But I mean, I, I commend our leaders who have been out there in the forefront saying that stuff shouldn't happen because it takes a lot for them and they take a lot of blowback for it. I think, I think yes, but you know, someone needs to stand up. But I, I, I don't think that a politician, I don't think there's a politician in the Republican Party who, you know, can challenge a sitting president and just flip the switch like that. I think it has to be another public figure and, you know, the, the, there are plenty of folks that, uh, you know, the average Republican voter I think trusts more than Donald Trump. Um, you know, when, when Billy Graham, you know, gets up and says it, or I guess he won't anymore, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> when, you know someone like that says it. You know, there was this tipping point in Vietnam, right, where, um, you know, Walter Cronkite said all the, you know, I'm not sure we can win this anymore. That's the moment that needs to happen, and that's, you know, that's, that was a news anchor. That was not a politician. John, I'm just not sure. Johnson said if we lost Cronk if we lost Cronk right. we lost the country. You know, so I think that, you know, when Fox and Friends say that they're, you know, uh, that's, that's the moment that needs to happen. I think it's... A scary thought to leave us on that we're looking at the Fox and Friends to be the moral voice. <laughs> right. That um, uh, well, thank you, you three, so much for coming out. This was a, a really rewarding conversation. Um, thank you all for uh, coming out. Also, I'm sorry if we didn't get a chance to ask your questions. Um, as I said, this will be up online in a couple of days, uh, and hopefully, we can continue the conversation. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.